So I'm Yunan. I work at Netflix. I work on the Node platform there. And uh, I wanted to really, I'm really excited actually to talk to you guys today about building observable Node apps. And uh, before we start, let's just talk a little bit about Netflix and Node there. Have you guys heard of Netflix? Uh, no, no one's, we, we use Node, and we use Node to ship DVDs around the world. So that's, that's like the core, core competency. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so over the past uh, year and a bit, we started to transition our, a lot of our front end to Node.js. And I uh, don't know if you guys heard, but we've got 60, north of 60 million subscribers. So that's really exciting to be, be able to run Node at that scale. And uh, so our entire site today, the website, is completely on Node. So if you go to, if you go to Netflix.com, you'll see that. You see the new UIs, and you'll see everything will be hosted on Node. And we're also working to transition other devices and TVs and things like that to Node as well. <clears throat> and we're building a Node platform. So if any of that sounds exciting, we're hiring. And we'll pay you for your work. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> woo. So here's, here's what the site looks like today. This is all built on top of Node and React. Uh, this is sort of the non-member site. So if you're not a member, check it out. I heard we've got a trial, 30, 30 days for free. Netflix and chill? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so here, here's, here's, your, here's the account page. And we recently just rolled out our new member experience. So those of you that has Netflix, that have Netflix, will probably have seen this. But this is a, a really new slick UI that we, that we rolled out. Um, so this was a lot of fun, right, building the platform. Because you're, you're getting to working a new field. You're leaving all the legacy <clears throat> Java stuff behind and working on new things. And you're not. It's a lot of fun. You got to work with new technology. But at some point, management and uh, They'll come, come up and say, hey, can we ship this to production? We really want to ship this to production, right? And what's something that you think about, at least this is what I think about when I hear the word production, right? Things are on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, having worked in the infrastructure space before Netflix, this is literally what we think, what I think when I think about production. And to even sort of put this in perspective, one of my old colleagues likes to say that production is war, right? <laughs> and it's because. You know, you guys might get really, really happy about Netflix because you're watching like Bojack Horseman or House of Cards. You're like, oh, it's awesome, right? But then when, when you can't watch your like obscure documentary or something because Netflix is down, then everybody turns into these bloodthirsty Klingons, right? So, um, and sure enough, right when we launched, we saw a whole bunch of pathologies, right? And these are sort of different, different errors. So this first one is increased errors. So each of those spikes are like four or 500 errors that we're sending back to, to customers. Not sure if I should be showing you guys this, but hey, <laughs> uh, whatever. The second one is increased latencies. So it's the exact same route, but over time, it just gets slower and slower and slower. And of course, we had to do a rolling reboot. And that's why you see like the, the peaks and the valleys as we rebooted the machines. And the last one is the ever-popular memory leak. So the, uh, <clears throat> the graph on the right is the, uh, the, the build before, which is fine. And the graph on the left is the new build, which shows your memory climbing. And so how do we go about you know, fixing these problems, right? Software is really, really complex. And uh, who's done this before? I certainly have, where you start just turning random knobs in, in the hopes that it'll work. Come on, every, I want to see everyone's hands up, because you're just lying if you're not doing this. You should have never done this, right? And uh, colloquially on Netflix, we call this the drunk man anti-method, because uh, we've all done it, and it never works. Or like the one time that it works, you're actually just you know, screwing yourself for the future, because you don't know actually how you fixed it. You're just like, oh, it fixed itself. <laughs> and then like 3 a.m. the next week, it comes back and you're like, damn it, right? So, <laughs> so how do we actually, you know, as engineers, as, as sort of scientists, how do we actually go about fixing this stuff, right? Well, this guy will help. Um, I'm dating myself a little bit. I used to watch this show as a kid. It was, it was a great show. This is, nobody knows, wow. Oh, uh, no, just, this, <laughs> this is data, right? This is data as Sherlock Holmes. And there's this really qu great quote from Sherlock Holmes that talks about Data. And so it's, it's a capital mistake to theorize before you've got, you have the data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to sue theories instead of theories to sue facts. And that's really, really like a really great quote around just solving things with the scientific method, right? Like, make sure you have the data so you can actually know, uh, you can use the data to sort of formulate a hypothesis about what's wrong and not just guess. And so, how we decided to sort of approach our stack is we wanted to build observability from the ground up so that we can get, critically get data. And once we have the data, if we have issues, then we can use the data to help us solve the problems. Now, it's really, really hard already in development, right, to, to sort of debug issues, because um, bugs are just generally not, like, they're just hard problems, and software is really complex. But it's really even harder in production when you might not have some of the same tools. And it's insanely hard at 3 a.m. in the morning when you've just been paged, and 
customers are calling customer service, and the engineer is saying, why isn't this fixed already, right? So, so what we try to do is actually we try to build our development environment and our production environment to be exactly the same, so that we have the same set of tooling and the same set of metrics. And that's really, really critical for us with uh, 60 million plus subscribers. And so what's one sort of uh, one system that everyone uses to get data into their applications? It's this, right? It's logs, right? Everyone uses logs. Uh, <laughs> Everyone uses logs because that's like the easiest way to get uh, access to, to metrics from your app, right? You, you, you just log some stuff out to, to, to the disk. And so one of the modules that we use quite, a, quite, a bit, quite heavily is Bunyan, and I'm sure some folks here have used it as well. But uh, what's really, really nice about Bunyan is that, is that it uses this streaming JSON logging format. And so what streaming JSON is, is just it's a way to encapsulate JSON objects into a text stream. Right, so um, you have an object on each line, and there's, they're delivered by new lines, and lots of APIs use this. Twitter's API uses streaming JSON. And so why is this great? Why is streaming JSON so powerful? It's because it lets you use the Unix philosophy with your data, right? So do one thing, do, do it well, and use streams of text as the common interface. And so if our logs are in streaming JSON, then we can use a lot of these same, same Unix tools to sort of do analytics on our logs. And what's really cool is since nodes come out, there's been a ton of actual um, sort of Unix-like tools like JQ and JSON that lets you do processing on specifically to, to JSON, right? And that's really, really powerful. So I can do stuff like query my logs in real time. And this is an example we'll get into later, but this prints the distribution of a particular request timer um, across our logs. And that's just with a, with a Unix command line. Here's the drawback of, of JSON, all right? I can't read it. Uh, <laughs> it's a little uh, obscure, but What's really nice about Bunyan is that it ships with a CLI. And so the CLI nicely formats all of your logs for you in like a human readable format. And uh, it, makes, it makes life a lot easier. The other thing that the Bunyan CLI does is lets you actually query your logs with JavaScript. And we'll show an example of that later as well. But to, let's talk about some of the features, right? I think the easiest way to show you a feature, some of the features with Bunyan is using an example. So here I've got a Bunyan log, uh, some, uh, some Bunyan logging code. And one of the really nice things about Bunyan is that and all this code I'll make available later, uh, it's on my GitHub, uh, is that it lets you inline just JavaScript objects into your logger. So, I mean, we're all in JavaScript, everything's in JSON, so that makes sense. So, so here, you can see that my, I have some authentication info, information that I want to log out. It's just a plain old JSON object. And down there, I'm just doing logged out info, and I'm directly inlining this as a property to my, to my, JSON, to my log file. And so what, what shows up in my, as, as, as my JSON object is actually my authentication info there, right, where it's, Literally just another property. And this is really handy to, when you're using a lot of these analytics tools because you can, instead of having to type out this complex regular expression when you're trying to look for a specific string, you can just look for a property. Um, so let's talk about something else, right? Let's talk about serializers. This is another great feature. And so here's what a serializer is. Um, it, all, all a serializer is is lets you mutate specific objects. And so it, the interface is just a function, and you can do whatever you like with the object itself. And so if you're Ashley Madison, maybe you should have done this and scrubbed all passwords and usernames, but um, here's, here's that example, right, where we're scrubbing out our, our password from our auth info. And so now you'll see that now my password's just being scrubbed out. And so serializers are really powerful, not just for this, but it gives you the ability to mutate your data however you like. So like if I'm dumping out my request, my known, my, my known request object, there's, a, there's, there's buffers in there, there's lots of stuff that I don't want to see in my log, so I can just scrub that out with, uh, with a serializer. And then the last feature I wanted to show is streams. So streams are this really powerful concept in computing in general, but Bunyan ships with a streams interface so that you can send your logs anywhere you like. So here I'm showing you a syslog um, stream, and so this will take your logs and send them to our syslog, so really cool. And there's tons of other stream plugins out there. There's one that sends it to Kafka, there's one that sends it to Slack, wherever you like, where you can send them out to Unix domain sockets or TCP, TCP sockets or whatever you like, really. And so it gives you this really great way to be able to um, customize where your logs can go. And so to summarize the features of Bunyan, lightweight API, right? First class JSON objects, really, really powerful. Um, you can extend Bunyan to use, um, to, to, send it, to send the streams anywhere you like with uh, the streams interface, and the serializers let you arbitrarily mutate your objects. So that's kind of cool, but you know, for us, really, um, our core thing of using Node and Netflix is to serve HTTP requests, right? And so, over the, the threat of an HTTP request, we might make some API calls, we might persist some state to a file system, we'll query the database, we'll update some caches. But what's like the common thread here that ties all of these together? Right? What's something that's common to all of these? They're all async. 
right? They're all, they're all just async, async crawls. And so if you're, a, you know, if you just started writing JavaScript or you know, you've never written JavaScript before and you go about trying to do this kind of async, these sets of async requests that all tie together, you might call, write code that looks like this, right? And everyone's seen this before. Uh, it's called back hell, right? Um, and there's a lot of elegant solutions to sort of solving this problem. Right, I'm glad that gets a laugh. Um, there's a lot of really elegant solutions, and so one of them is um, the async model, right, where you stuff all of your functions into an array, and then a, a framework like async will run through all these functions for you one by one, so you're not you're not in this big stack of callbacks. Uh, this is really great, but because we want to have observable async workflow, um, there's another there's another um, framework out there called vAsync, which gives you that observability into your async workflow. And what do I mean by that, right, is here's an example. So I've got three functions here that I want to run serially, but let's say there's a bug somewhere here. This is, this is artificial, but we're not returning the callback in the third, third function. And this has actually hit me in the passing production where we've updated the Postgres driver, and then like 50% of the time when you initiate a new connection, it just never returns a callback. And so now your code's just gone off into space and it's just stuck, right? And you like take a core dump, you look at the stack trace, and it's just in libuv polling because there's no work to do. And this is how you feel, and like this, right? So the nice thing about vAsync is that with every single async um, operation that you perform with it, it returns this results object. And this gives you all of your asynchronous function states. So, you can, so in that example, we can see that the first function has failed, which is good to know, right? And you can see that the second function was successful, and you can see that the third function is pending. And there's some other information, like how many functions have finished and how many have errors. And all this is really helpful, but now that I, now that I have this object, I know that, hey, a, a function is pending, and let, that lets me narrow down the surface error in which to try to fix the bug. Right? And you can see this in production by dumping this results object to your logs. You can take a core dump. You can build REPLs or AP, APIs on top of this. And we, we just generally dump it out the log every once in a while to, so we can have all of these objects. And core dumps are really good, too. I think uh, Luca is going to give a great talk later on um, how to examine core dumps. You guys should not skip that. That's, that's going to be a great talk. So now where are we, right? We're talking about, we really want to build, at the end of the day, is an observable node HTTP app, right? And here are some of the things that we want. We want, observ we want observability, of course. We want metrics. And we'd really like to have bunny integration because that means that I can perform all kinds of analytics on my logs. And so the, the framework that we use at, at Netflix is Restify. And uh, Restify is just like every other in terms of this interface, very similar to all of the other frameworks out there for Node. But it's got some really key features that we love, and one of them is called the auto log. And this gives you key information for each and every request that comes through the system. And here's an example of what, what the audit log looks like. So let me zoom in a little bit here. And so this gives you, with every request for free, you get stuff like the status code, um, you get the headers, right? You get the URL, you get request latency, you get request headers. You get the UID of, of each request. You guys request timers. And this is all in streaming JSON, so this is really easy to query and do perform analytics on. But let's look a little bit closer, right, and look at this latency here. <laughs> so this is a production log, actually, and it took us 7,000 milliseconds to serve this request, right? So seven seconds to serve a request to customers. So now, that's terrible. Um, I'm sure that if you went to Netflix and took seven seconds, you'd be pretty mad, too. Um, and so we're, we are always constantly looking at our worst requests and trying to figure out why they, went, they, they took so long and try to fix them, right? But if all I had was the request latency here, I actually, I wouldn't know where to look, right? I know like it's this URL, and, but uh, you know, for each URL, we have an entire list of function handlers that we use to handle this request. So what we really like to do is be able to isolate where all that time took, uh, where, where all of that time was spent in terms of our function handlers. So the rest of it will ship with some, as part of the, um, the auto log, timing information for each and every one of your function handlers inside your function chain. And so now we can see that <clears throat> there are two functions that took most of the time. The time here is in microseconds, so that's why it looks really, really big. So it took three seconds for us to go off to API to make some requests, and it took us three, three and a half seconds to render out the markup. So now we know at least that exactly like the two places that we need to sort of um, look and try to figure out why that took so long, but it at least lets us help, helps us reduce the surface area. So for rendering, maybe we can look at like the rendering framework that we're using and do some CPU profiling. For going off the API, maybe that's network latency, but at least we know where to look, which is really helpful. But in terms of logs, right, everyone's had this problem too, where you have too many logs, and it just becomes really, really verbose, and it's hard for you to look through. And you know, as, as sort of operators of the same system that we, we uh, engineer, there's always this trade-off. right? You want to capture as much state as you can with each request. right? I would love to capture every stateful object that comes through um, through the lifetime of my request, 
And I want to, I would want, I'd love to be able to just debug out all, all the different logic and the stateful um, logic that I'm doing, that I'm performing. But if we were doing that with the traffic that we were seeing, one, it would cost a lot of money, and two, all the machines, all the instances would just be furiously um, writing logs to the disk, right? We wouldn't actually be doing anything else. And so, if you really think about this problem, really what we want to do is only capture additional state when there's an error, right? When, there's, when you're having 200s, you know what, Maybe I only really want the auto log, because it's just showing me um, the core metrics, and I can use that later on to perform analytics. But when I do have an error, that's when I really care about, um, to, when I want to see all the state in the system. And so there's this really great plugin that Restify ships, <clears throat> which is called a request capture stream. And so remember how we talked about bunion streams before? This is just another bunion stream, so it's on top of what you already have. And it's really cool because it captures all of your logging statements at the trace level in memory, in, in, the, in the shape of a ring buffer. And it'll only dump out the logs for a particular request when there's an error on that request. So in, in the normal case, that's just in memory. Nothing's really being, nothing, it's not being dumped out to disk, so there is not big of a performance penalty. But when there is an error, when you really do care about that request, and you want to figure out why it broke, then we do dump all the logs for that request, right? And so here's an example of that. Um, here's my request capture stream. And you can see it's literally just a stream on my, on my logging object, and it comes from um, the rest of our framework. And what, we see, what we've got here is some, some um, function handling code. So you can see my first handler here, I'm doing some authentication, and let's assume that huge authenticate blob is this really large object. And I don't want to dump it out every time because it's expensive, right? So I'm I'm logging it at a debug level, and so that will never print in production. But then, 50% um, of the time, let's say that fails, right? So we log a warn or we throw back an error. Then only at that instance will we get all the context, and that's really great because now I can go around and look in my logs and find all the context for that particular error and really drive these through costs because. You know, our, our, we're all about making sure that we, we're, we're always available and there for customers, and we don't want to send back any errors. So how do we drive that down is, how we go about driving that down is by root causing all the errors we see, and this is really helpful. So let's talk about finding the right logs, right? Has anyone seen this page before? I hope not, because we, we never do this. <laughs> but this is our 500 page. Uh, I'm glad that there, there's no hands. <laughs> Uh, so in addition to that, actually, we, we hide some things in the DOM and headers, and there are two really important pieces of information. Uh, one of them is the EC2 instance ID, and the other two is the actual request ID. And so with these two pieces of information, then we can quickly log onto that instance, and then look for that request ID, and we can find the audit log, because you remember that the audit log had the request ID in it. But there's other logs that we actually want to, uh, that, that, that were associated with that request, right? But we, we want to be able to find those, those um, logs as well, and so there's this really great feature also called scope child loggers. And what that does is, so remember we talked about this request ID here in the auto log, right? Um, but what the request uh, logger lets you do is decorate that request ID to each logging statement that you've logged for the, for the context of that entire request. So here I'm using the request logger plugin, and you can see here these are just child, request, um, child log objects for that specific request. And every time I log these, you'll see over here that these are also decorated with the request ID. So now it's really, really easy for me to find all the logs for that specific request. I feel I log onto the instance, I just perform a quick grep on that request ID, and I find all my logs. And so to sum up, uh, with Restify, uh, in terms of observability, you get native binding integration, you get the request capture stream that lets you dump logs when there's an error, you get the auto logs that gives you all of your key metrics at your fingertips, and you get the scope child loggers that let you easily find when, um, all the logs for when there's an issue. How about processing all of this data, right? Well, that's actually really, really easy. So like, like I said before, here's the example where I look for, want to look for all the logs of a particular specific request. I can just grab for a U ID. I can count the number of non-200 responses. And here I'm literally just inlining some JavaScript to the bunny and CLI, where this is the actual JSON object. So I'm saying find this, find the response object where the status code is not 200. I'm dumping out the num number of non-200 responses. Here's, <clears throat> here's um, showing all the requests that took longer than 200 milliseconds. <clears throat> and here's a really advanced example, and it's still just a one-liner in Unix, I'm not lying, where it prints out a, the distribution of request latencies broken down by URL, right? And this is just in a Unix one-liner. Um, and this is really helpful because it lets our engineers who are working on different endpoints figure out you know, where the request, request distributions are. So to sum up, with Restify and JSON, you get all these metrics, right? You, and it's using streaming JSON, you get processing with Unix tools. It's very easy to do all of this with all these tools. And so with all these frameworks, now we're able to solve a lot of the problems we saw earlier when it comes to increased errors and latency. 
And so if you're interested, um, Restify, we have a lot of core contributors on Netflix because we're so heavily, we're leveraged so heavily as part of our stack. And if you're interested, you should check it, check it out. Um, and so in summary, here's what our production observability looks like. Um, I haven't even talked about Dtrace yet. That's just, that's probably another talk. But <clears throat> with Restify and Bunyan, you get all the metrics via your audit logs. Um, one thing that I did forget to mention is that you can actually process all of your logs uh, with a distributed processing framework as well, right? Because they're just J streaming JSON, so you can use Elasticsearch or Giant's Manta or Hive or Spark or whatever you want. And so in terms of your observability toolkit, VAsync, use that to get observability into your async operations, which are really hard to debug unless you have that observability. Use Bunyan to get streaming JSON logs so you can easily analyze them. And use Restify to take advantage of Bunyan to get build observable REST apps. Of course, use the Unix philosophy to easily process your JSON logs. So thanks, everyone. Um, we're hiring. Did I forget to mention that? We're, we're hiring. I've got some stickers up here, so I'll, I'll leave them at the bar, the Netflix stickers, and uh, take some questions if there are any. Yeah, so there's, you can set the number of records you want to keep and the number of requests you want to keep. So then it's a ring buffer. So then you can say, I want to keep 1,000 records, right? And then as you hit the 1,000 records, then it starts to delete the ones from the front. Cool. Oh, okay. Oh, so the, it's pending as long as that framework, um, you haven't re invoked the callback from that specific inner function. So the framework will invoke the function and wait for the callback to return. And it keeps track of all the function states. So it knows that it sets a depending, invokes the, invokes the callback, sets a depending, and then if it hasn't returned, if the callback hasn't returned, it just it never returns from pending. Does that make sense? How is that marked as error though to get flushed to the What do you mean? If it's pending, it's yeah. marked as It's not an error. It just no it you, at least but but you'll know let's say you have ten of these functions you're running through, right? At least you know like function number five is pending and you can keep looking at that object as it's being updated in real time to see if it's actually stuck there, right? Um, so <clears throat> what we do is actually we take a core DOM for the process, and then we can just walk the core DOM for these objects and see. But if, if you can't, if you don't want to do that, you can just do set timeout or set interval before you run the function and just dump it out until it's done and clear the interval. It's one of the easy ways. Cool. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>